Well, we're going to talk now to Professor of US and International Politics at the Clinton Institute, University College Dublin. Scott Lucas, who joins us on the programme then. Uh, early days, but it does appear we may not be getting at the moment immediate strikes, at least uh, from Israel on Iran. That must ease tensions very sh slightly anyway, at least in the short term. Well, I think the starting point, and I had sort of expected this, is that Iran's attacks on Israel were demonstration attacks. Now, of course, they were large demonstration attacks with more than 300 missiles and drones, but Iran telegraphed days in advance they were going to do this, and they fired on sparsely populated areas. The Israeli air bases in the Negev Desert, parts of the uh, Israeli-occupied Golan Heights in Syria. In other words, Iran wanted to look tough, especially to its own people, in response to the Israeli assassinations of its commanders, but it wasn't going for direct confrontation with Israel. And on the other hand, uh, the United States and the international community have let the Israelis know that they will not support direct Israeli airstrikes inside Iran. And to be frank with you, for more than a decade, Israel's military and intelligence community have held back Prime Minister Netanyahu from doing exactly that. So both sides now have made their demonstrations. They talk about, well, action of our own choosing in the future language that both Tehran and Israel use. And now we see if they actually step back and de-escalate and, of course, ask ourselves, do we return to looking at the open-ended war in Gaza, where, of course, people will continue to die on a daily basis? So you think we'd be in a very different uh, position today than if uh, even one missile had got through and, and hit a populated area? That's absolutely right. That if, if Iran had caused significant civilian casualties and they did seriously wound uh, one seven-year-old girl, but if we're talking about dozens of casualties, or, or if they had, had hit a city, for example, you know, if they hit Jerusalem, if they hit Tel Aviv, if they have hit Haifa, uh, then you're talking about Israel almost in a corner where it has to respond at this point. And the Iranians are letting it be known in every statement they make. It is, look, we didn't do this to actually go for all out war. We just wanted to show, in fact, that we could hit Israel. Yeah, Joe Biden urging Benjamin Netanyahu, as he put it, to take the win, saying Israel has come out on top of all these exchanges over the last few weeks. I mean, do you think it, we can go as far as saying Iran's attack failed, or was it simply that's what they were aiming to do? From a military point of view, there's no way of measuring success because, you know, they weren't really aiming to cause mass damage, and they didn't do so. There was only minor damage to that field. Uh, in the Negev Desert, despite what Iranian media is saying. The question here is, did they succeed in deterring Israel from continuing the targeted assassinations of its commanders? Because remember, those targeted assassinations inside Syria did not start on April 1st with the killing of one of Iran's highest ranking generals, General Zahedi. They started in December when Iran's top commander in Syria was killed. And then in January, when the head and deputy head of intelligence in Syria were killed. Now, does Israel return to the targeted assassinations? And if they do so, do they make sure they do not hit the Iranian embassy compound, which was really the red line that they crossed a few weeks ago? Israel's going to have to do something, though, isn't it? Because otherwise the hard right in Israel is not going to be happy with some kind of mild status quo, is it? Well, I mean, there's always the question about the, the far right inside the Israeli cabinet. But remember that the war cabinet itself is only three people, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, and the former head of the Israeli military, Benny Gantz. And the question is, what do those three gentlemen decide? And I think if Israel can be persuaded that, in other words, first of all, that the international community has its back against any future Iranian attack. Secondly, that the international community will support further economic and political measures to put the squeeze on the Iranian regime, which is in serious trouble at home, has serious economic and political challenges. And thirdly, if the international community, as it were, gives Israel sort of a free role in areas such as Syria to continue to attack, let's say, Iranian shipments of weapons and missiles to Hezbollah there, then I think that will be the extent of the action that Israel takes at this point. And finally, a lot of diplomatic activity today. We heard earlier on Emmanuel Macron is going to speak with Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm sure a lot of other world leaders will be as well, telling him to, to keep it calm, keep it cool. Absolutely. Because, look, in 2012, Netanyahu wanted to strike Iran directly with airstrikes over its nuclear program. 
And while Israel did, of course, carry out sabotage of Iran's nuclear program inside the country, the Israeli military and intelligence community kept Netanyahu from that overt action that would have led the region to spiral out of control. Here we are 12 years later, and the international community is speaking not just to Netanyahu, but to Israel's military and intelligence commanders saying, OK, we need to make sure you don't cross that line again. Go ahead and challenge Iran in the region, but don't hit them directly. Scott Lucas, thanks very much for joining us uh, on the programme today. Professor of US and International Politics at the Clinton Institute at University College Dublin. Thanks very much.